back to Plato. Well, let's, uh, let's put him up here. Last time we talked about a couple of people in the dialogue and their definitions of justice. We started with Catalyst. How did Catalyst describe justice? What was his definition? Or is it Henry Yeah, so tell tell him the truth. And and your deaths. So these are the things that you need to be just, to be described as just. The problem is it doesn't work, right? And it doesn't work for a few reasons. The primary reason is that, well, it doesn't work as a definition. Right? It doesn't cover all cases, and the cases that it does cover aren't all just. So it doesn't provide necessary and sufficient conditions in part because it doesn't describe justice in quite the right way. As we'll see as we continue, neither do the, any of the other definitions proposed in the first book. So if you were looking for a quick and easy answer, wrong book. Um, Plato kind of gives an answer eventually, but we'll get there. But only kind of. He more gestures at an answer. So we're going to have to kind of construct it ourselves. It's okay, telling the truth and paying your debts. So it doesn't work because there are other just things, and telling the truth isn't always just. You can harm someone by telling the truth. You can tell the truth to the wrong person in the wrong circumstance. You can mislead someone by telling the truth. <coughs> and paying your debts. Well, you, ought, you don't necessarily um, <coughs> Giving something back to someone that you owe them isn't always necessarily going to be just because they can do unjust things with it. You can be helping someone to do something unjust. All right, so with this one eliminated as a possibility, uh, we get Paul Marcus. Which is Capitalist's son. So what was his definition? Help friends, harm enemies. So, help uh, friends or do good to friends. And bad to enemies. Or harm. Yeah. harm. Paul Marcus. Uh, this is the guy who comes in at. If anybody has the line number, feel free to shout out. Um, it's 330 something. Yes, yep, 331D is where Paul Marcus comes into the conversation. Or, yeah, around there, C or D. I think D. Yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, and he's Cephalus' son, so he takes up a similar definition, still based on this, this handed down tradition that Cephalus is working with, but he interprets it differently. And the thing he's interpreting uh, is the poet Simonides' definition, which is uh, give to each what is owed to them, or render to each their due, is another way you'll see it translated. You may have heard this in other contexts. You will probably hear it in other contexts. Rendering to each is due. On a side note, why a poet? Why are they citing a poet about what justice means? Yeah, so first of all, po well, um, in general, poets could read, right? read and write. But I will note, in, especially in, in ancient Greek culture, reading was a slave's job. Reading was awful. It was a terrible experience. It was, it, was, it was something no one wanted to actually have to do. It was a lot of work. Because you had large books that were scrolls, 
And the process of reading involves <coughs> one, cranking it, right, as you go. Um, yeah. Uh, and then also, uh, there was no such thing as capitalization or punctuation, or spaces between words. Get a wing. Right. You can imagine if this book were written just as a series of letters, no spaces, no punctuation. You wouldn't want to read it either. Maybe you don't now, but hopefully you do. It would certainly interrupt that flow state, right? You wouldn't be just reading it and understanding what's being said. You'd have to do it as a process. You'd have to sort of decode it as you read. If you, is anyone bilingual? Is anyone slightly less than bilingual? As in, you have a first language and you can mostly understand a second? All right, so your second language. Do you read it like you read your first language? I don't even know how to read it for me. There you go, right? <laughs> and even if you can read it, you probably don't read what it says and understand it. What you do is you read, correct me if I'm wrong, you read it, you translate it in your mind into your native language, and then you understand it that way. If you're, now, if you were raised bilingually, this yeah. probably doesn't apply to you. You can probably read and write and understand both languages perfectly well. Uh, or if you spend enough time immersed in a language. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, you know, learned in school, this will happen. Right. Um, I, 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 you can get to the point where you can simply just read a language like it's your own. I got, I, I got that way. At one point with Spanish, although I'm not sure I can still do it quite so fluently. Was that? I was say, do you still remember? Mostly. I can understand it. I can't speak yeah. it quickly. I never could speak it too quickly. Um, and I, I can generally read it without translating in my head. I can't do that with Latin. Not usually. Simple things maybe. But as, as part of my studies, I'm learning Latin. And in order to read Latin, what I have to do is figure out what words mean in English and put it together. That's what reading was in most of the ancient world. It was a pain. Sometimes literally, because also reading desks were awful and not ergonomic in any way. Which all is to say that it wasn't necessarily a mark of high society to be able to read. Now, to be able to compose and be able to remember stories and be able to write things and that sort of thing, or that sort of thing, maybe. Yes, that's true. But what's unique about poets? What poets? Yeah. They're, they're creators, innovators. Their imagination, so kind they of. can think of things that possibly someone else could not think of. Yes and no. So they can put things together. They can construct new things. But what they would construct from was always old parts. Why this was the case was because uh, ancient Greece was mostly an illiterate society. Most people didn't read and write. Most people learned everything that they learned through passed on stories. Which, have you ever read the Iliad or the Odyssey? Anyone? Keep your hand up if you really read it. That's what I thought. Because if you really read it, you would, you would realize that there are passages in it that are repeated from, roughly speaking, from chapter to chapter. And those passages that are repeated are normal, everyday tasks that are described in detail in exactly the same way at this point and this point and that point. And that's so you can remember how to do it, and that's so you can remember how to tell someone how to do it. Rigging a sail is explained in immaculate detail multiple times throughout the Odyssey. Exactly how they rigged the sail. Every time it's identical. It's impressive. Especially when you consider that most of these were remembered orally. So poets were the people who remembered these things and recomposed them in a new way. They were the people who knew how to do everything, or at least knew how to explain how to do everything. They're who you go to if you want to know something. Poets were Google. <laughs> Google doesn't necessarily know things. Poets might not have known, known but so you, ne you wouldn't necessarily want a, want a poet on your ship instead of a sailor. But it'd be nice having a poet to train your sailors. So a poet is who you go to if you want to know something. They carried the knowledge of past generations through. So this is where traditions and where traditional knowledge 
comes from. And we, we see the same thing right, in today's society, except we see it in, in our forms of media transmission. So we see it in books, we see it in literary people, people who are, who are well read. Right? If you're not sure about something, ask that person who always knows something about it. That's the equivalent of, of asking the poet. All right, so that's why they're going off of this, this handed down knowledge. But they are interpreting it in different ways. Kepler interprets it in a fairly straightforward kind of way. Here's some practical advice we can get from this saying. Right? Render to each is due. What does that mean? Well, pay your debts. Uh, everyone is owed the truth, so tell them the truth. There's some things. There's some just things to do. Not a great definition, though, if we're thinking about things very carefully and closely. So, Polymarchus tries a little bit differently. Well, we owe help and good things to friends. By friends here, he means people who do good things for us. And we owe bad things and harm to enemies, people who mean us harm, malevolent people. Okay, so what's wrong here? Because Socrates, of course, objects here as well. Yeah? Well, not, uh, not everyone who does good to you is like good. Right. So there can be a difference between being good to you and being good in general. Especially if you're not a very good person, chances are your allies are also not very good people, your friends and your allies, and people who mean you, mean you well. And the people who mean you harm are often the most good and just people. So it doesn't very much, it doesn't seem all that just to owe harm to good people. Okay, what else? Um, the people that's taking care of both the friends and the enemy, like Dalsy. Yes, so people where it's not clear, or people who do both. You don't seem to fit into fit nicely into a category. Right? It seems like this ca this categorization covers everybody, right? You've got people who mean you well, people who mean you harm. You can include people who have no react no interaction with you whatsoever. It's strangers. You don't owe them anything, so you you don't owe any interaction to them. All right. But then there's the people who help everyone. Doctors is a great example. You don't owe, no one owes harm to a doctor, but the doctor helps your enemy. Yes, he helps you, but he also helps your enemy. So you owe him help, you owe him good things for helping you, and you owe him harm for helping your enemy. What happens? Well, you may have encountered a problem in the theory. You found a contradiction. Here's another potential problem to do with the sort of neutral people. Um, how do you act to strangers? Well, you don't <coughs> owe them anything. You don't interact with them. How does any society or any interaction begin? Someone needs something. Yeah. Why should you give it to them? You don't owe them anything. Justice says you should just ignore them. Right? The problem here is it's assuming that we already have these networks of friends and enemies and that these networks are universal, right? that it applies to everybody. Because otherwise, there are people who you will never interact with. And you would have no reason to begin interacting with them, even if you need them for something. Yeah. So I kind of like have like a, my own definition mm. of justice, right? All right, sure. Let's give it a shot. Um, let me see if I can Socrates. Yeah. <laughs> um, I say doing the right thing, whether it's bad or good. I mean, like, How do you mean bad or good? Like, clarify. If you were to tell the truth, mm -hmm. you know, it could be bad. If you tell the truth um, to do good, then it's good. So it's like okay. it covers the good and evil part. All right, so doing the right what thing. What you think is right, so if you're lying about it. All right, so doing the right thing regardless of whether it helps or harms, especially whether it helps yeah, or harms you. Whether it helps or harms, yes. Okay, yeah. So I'll tell you one thing. <coughs> Very, it's 
It's much closer to Socrates' eventual definition than anything we've looked at so far. So I think you're on the right track. Plato probably thinks you're on the right track. But there's an issue. What's the right thing to do? Which, which part? <laughs> well, there is where you part ways with Plato, right? So the issue here, the issue here is, if, if the right thing to do is always what you feel is right, if two people feel differently about something, well, it's the same thing, the same action, <clears throat> then we, can, we encounter a problem. And that problem is that that thing, that action, is good and it's bad. It's just and it's unjust. And that leads to the same kinds of conflicts that we have with, Kef with, uh, sorry, with Paul Marcus' definition. Right? So another problem, which actually ties into with, 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 with uh, what may be going wrong here, right? is that, all right, so you guys, this time, assume you are all friends, and assume you're all friends, and assume you hate each other. And pause before you act on this. Um, not, don't do it in class. Um, I need a volunteer. All right, great. What should you do to, I need a volunteer from over here. Great. What should you do to her? In the abstract terms. <laughs> not not good things, right? Bad things, right? Your enemy. She's your enemy. You should do you should hurt her, right? So you, what should you do to him? Harm him. Right, right. <laughs> You're hurting her, she's hurting you. Everything is just in the world. But wait, hold on. Something's going wrong here. Kind of. Why? Why is this unjust? Because your harm is alone. Yes, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, right? So that's in, that's true in part, and, and Socrates will make that argument. I want I want to I want to go into much more detail on that on Thursday. Because you don't owe them anything. Well, you do, right? Apparently, apparently at least, you owe them harm, your enemies, right? You really ought to just beat the crap out of all of these people, at least if you can. And then likewise for all of you, you should fight back, right? So yeah, what? It's, it's always wrong. going to cause a conflict. Right, that's a big problem. There's always going to be conflict happening. And also, maybe it's not a fair fight between us. That's true. Might not be, right? So you might have, so this is a little bit evenly matched, but let's say you guys, and you guys are okay with it. Not an even match anymore, right? You have fewer friends than you do. That's unfortunate. But it's just. <laughs> is it though? I, I don't think it is, right? So here's part of the problem, right? Part of the problem is that there's always going to be conflict. There's usually going to be lopsided conflict. But even when there is a lopsided conflict, both sides are in the right. Both sides are acting justly by trying to stop the other side from what? You by fighting him. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to protect my. You no, owe him harm, I'm, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to harm him. Right. <laughs> By harming him, what are you stopping him from doing? Harming me. Right. You're stopping him from being just. Wait. <laughs> so we see the problem. We're, we see the problem starting to develop, right? So you guys on this side, right, your, your justice demands that you harm the people over here. But justice demands also that you guys harm the people over here back. And if you're harming each other, after not very long, you won't be able to do it anymore. Right. Or one of us is gonna die. And then you won't be able to harm the other side anymore, right? <laughs> um, and you won't be able to help each other either. Right? I love and cherish my life. I, right, so th there's issues here, and this doesn't seem <coughs> to work. And a big problem is that it conflicts. Justice seems to be causing injustice, or at least preventing justice from being done. Yeah? So in a way, just you can see justice as being neutral? Because what if you don't want to be good and bad or do anything to harm anyone? Kind of like turning the cheek, like if somebody hits you, just don't hit them back. There's something to it there. There's something to that. And you're agreeing, you're agreeing I will say, with, with Socrates a little bit later, around 335, if you look into 
if you see someone that's brown that's getting beat up, is it best to go away from that? I mean, it is not your problem. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> run now. <laughs> well, run. I couldn't agree there. Right. And we'll see why. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at why on Thursday. This is what we're going to focus on then. But for now, I want to point out that there's issues with this. First of all, with their, their inherent contradictions with, with fighting one another and it being just. This is like saying that, think about World War I. Right? Often we say there weren't really any good guys in World War I. Everyone was just fighting each other. This, Polemarchus would say, no, no. Both sides were right. <laughs> All of that mustard gas was glorious. So, yeah, that was, that was pure justice bleeding from your eyes. Wonderful, right? But that's, that, that's incoherent. It can't be just to try and prevent someone else from being just. And also, you're, those are like governments hmm? using individual people with their own ideas. With like, you got to train your own folks. Yeah, so uh, I want to touch on this on Thursday as well. So uh, if, I, if I skip it, remind me, because this is another problem. What do you owe some stranger from another country you happen to be at war with? They're not necessarily your enemy. They're someone's enemy who you're allied with. Or not really, not even that. They're someone's, they're someone's ally who someone you're allied with happens to be enemies with. There are multiple degrees of separation here. That's an issue as well. And then what happens if you're friends? Which obligation comes first? Problems there as well. So suffice it to say, there are problems with the application of this. It can't be applied consistently. One note before we leave is that Socrates points all of this out. <clears throat> and then basically what he does is say, yeah, all right, that's all great. There's a lot of problems with this. But guess what? Everything I just said is irrelevant because there are more fundamental flaws. Right? This is a great way to argue. You undermine the crap out of your opponent's argument, and you show that here's all of the problems with the argument. So here's why it can't stand. Here's why it doesn't work. The argument's bad. But wait, it's worse. So not only are there all of these problems, but the fundamental premises of the opponent's argument are incorrect. There are fundamental problems with the argument. Uh, that go beyond just, well, it can't be applied. Oh, there's theoretical issues, and we'll get to those Thursday. So I'll see you then. Uh, no extra reading assignments. It's just, um, feel free to go back over the uh, conversation with Paul Marcus. Uh, and it won't be until next week until we get into uh, percentage arguments. So we'll see you on Thursday.